good morning or good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Um, we welcome you, University of Arizona alumni, students, and friends. Uh, we thank you for joining us today for our Cats in the Corner office. Today, we're meeting with UA alumni and Macy's CEO, Terry Lundgren. I'm Melinda Burke, president of the UA Alumni Association, and this event is part of our Alumni Career Services Program, which helps alumni find jobs, build their networks, and advance their careers. For more information on this and other programs, you can go to ArizonaAlumni.com slash careers. And today's conversation is being recorded, and it will be archived on the Alumni Association website for members of the Alumni Association to access on demand. Questions are all also welcome at any time during the event. Please type your question into the chat box for Mr. Lundgren. We have a team here that are looking at our questions and will be submitting them on to us. Again, thank you for participating in this event. And now I'd like to introduce our very special guest. Mr. Lundgren has been Macy's CEO since February of 2003 and Chairman and CEO since January of 2004. Earlier, he was president, a title he also assumed in February of 2003. He began his career in 1975 as a trainee with Bullocks, a division of Federated, which later became Macy's, and over the next decade, he held positions of increasing responsibility in buying, store management, human resources, and senior level store management and merchandising. He joined Neiman Marcus and uh, became executive vice president and later chairman and CEO. In April of 94, he returned to Macy's as chairman and CEO of its merchandising group, before rising to president and ultimately CEO. Now, even more important than that, he's a 1975 graduate of the University of Arizona, and he came back to campus in 1995 to speak to students with an inspiring presentation from campus to CEO, which I remember well, and it drew hundreds of students. Since that time, Terry has been an outstanding partner for the University of Arizona, establishing scholarships, uh, supporting the creation of a career services center in the student union, and most recently taking the University of Arizona's retail center on a transformational journey to national prominence. In 2005, faculty in the Norton School um, honored Mr. Lundgren by naming the center after him, and today we're broadcasting from the Terry J. Lundgren Center for Retailing on the U of A campus. So, I'm delighted to have Mr. Lundgren here today. Um, he has received uh, just about every award the University of Arizona can give to our distinguished alumni. And today he joins us as our cat in the corner office. So welcome, Mr. Lundgren. Thank you, Melinda. I'm nice so glad to see you're you. here. Uh, we actually have known each other for many years. Long time. Since, uh, I had the privilege of working in the retail center for a Not long time. Not only working it, running it, and doing an amazing center. job. Well, thank you. So it's truly my pleasure to be able to to see him today and talk more about his career. Um, so let's start with uh, the early years. Can you tell me a little bit and share with our audience some of those early career lessons you learned and talk a bit about your early career path? Well, sure. Um, you know, first of all, I uh, when I was growing up, um, my my parents didn't go to college, you know, so so it wasn't the regular conversation at the dinner table about what school are you going to go to, you know, what are you going to major in. It wasn't it wasn't on the topic of the conversation. I had four I have four sisters and a brother. Uh, none of them went to college. None of them finished college. You know, I went. Uh, two of my sisters attended. Uh, but didn't finish. And so it wasn't, and I was fourth in line, you know, so it really wasn't a natural thing that I would even go to college after high school. I played sports in high school and, um, and, uh, like, like I think every, you know, high school kid, you know, I dreamed about playing, playing sports professionally or something. And, uh, and I, so, so my friends were going off to college and a couple of them were going to the university of Arizona. I grew up in Southern California. A couple of them were going to U of A and, that's really what got me going. And it wasn't for, for all the natural reasons that my kids, you know, experienced. I pounded into, you're going to college. Which college are you going to go to? That wasn't it with me. So it was very different. So I'll start, start there. So I went to, came to the U of A, actually tried out for the basketball team, mm -hmm. lasted almost like three practice sessions <laughs> before I was like blown away mm -hmm. by the talent that was here. So I figured I better do something educational to, for, to, for my future. Uh, and, uh, and, and then of course my first thing to do was to join a fraternity house. And, uh, I was a SIG app on campus here and, and that was a great experience and fun experience and a completely enjoyable experience. So fun. 
uh, that my father called me on my sophomore year and said, hey, I, looks, I got your report card. Looks like you're having a great time. You know, and I was a really good student in high school and I became a very mediocre student in college. And, and it was because I was so distracted. I never lived away from home. I was, you know, having the time of my life and, and you know, just enjoyed the fraternity life and all that. Long story short, my dad called, cut me off and said, you're on your own. We can't afford it. I'm working two jobs here, raising your four sisters and your brother. Uh, and I can't afford your fun time at the University of Arizona figure wow. it out. And I hope, and I said, and I hope you do, son. I really hope you graduate. I think it's really a great thing. Um, but I can't be on my dime. So, so I went to work, uh, I went searching for a job and I, I went to every place that would, uh -huh. you know, talk to me. And, um, and I, you know, the, the, the one person that finally was, had a job that I was able to do, I was qualified for, which was nothing, was uh, the Solarium restaurant. I remember. You remember? I remember the Solarium. It's no it longer burned there. Down. It yeah, burned it down, which is a sad yeah. story, but, but uh, burned down. It wasn't me. I didn't do <laughs> it. But, but it was, um, I went there and I remember interviewing with this, uh, the general manager. And it was, it was, uh, it was, that was a real wake up call. I mean, first, my dad's call was a wake up call. And then this interview with this general manager of this restaurant was a wake up call because I remember interviewing for this job and sitting on this uh, sofa talking to him and realizing and he, so he said, OK, um, we'll call you. And I started walking out the door. I realized he wasn't going to call me and that I wasn't even qualified to shuck oysters and peel shrimp. And I thought, if I can't do this what's the next job lower than this that I can do? You know, what's below this? And, and, and I said, wait a minute, I can do this. And I turned around, I went back to that general manager. And I said, wait, a minute, give me a shot at this. I will show you that I can peel these shrimp and shuck these oysters and I can do this very, really well. I, I'll work for free the first night to show you that I can do it. Give me a shot. And he just looked at me and said, well, why didn't you say so? Huh. That's what I was looking what a, for. What a great lesson. Yeah. Right? That's, yeah. He was looking for the spark in right. me as opposed to this defeatist attitude yes. that I, that I walked in with believing that I really, you know, my life was over. And, uh, and I even said on the phone call to my dad, I said, you're ruining my life by, by cutting me off. And he said, no son, if that's how you feel, you're ruining your life. Mm -hmm. Not me. And uh, that, is that was powerful. So, so all, all that, long story short, I started peeling shrimp and shucking oysters. I, I did well at that. In fact, one, one time this, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the wait, waitresses wouldn't show up. They hated that job. They liked serving cocktails. Mm -hmm. so they made more money. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't show up. And I ended up serving them. And I, and I broke the record for selling oysters at night and, and stuff. And it's because I was enthusiastic about it. And, and, I, and so, so then I became the head of it. Then I became a waiter. Then I... By the time I graduated, I had straight A's, and I was, the, and they offered me the manager of the restaurant. And I, and it was a, these are great lessons for me. Not everybody's going to be the same, but for me, I realized when I didn't have a lot of spare time to to, to screw around and make mistakes, that I was I could be very focused and get a lot done. And that's sort of the long way to say the University of Arizona was a very important part of my growing up phase of life. So from from the U of A. First two questions. How did you how did you find the retailing industry? I mean, it, 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 was it a class you took, or what was it that sort of ignited that passion? Well, it, no, it found me because okay. um, I started, and you, you remember this, but I, I came here also not knowing what I wanted to do. And, you know, I know a lot of college students say, this is what I want to be, this is what I want to do. And my college roommate, my fraternity roommate, was that way. He knew he was going to be an engineer. His father was an engineer. He was going to go back to Iowa and be an engineer. And he did that. But not many of us had that plan. I was going to be a veterinarian. So I was pre-vet medicine uh, when I started out. And at the same, about the same time that I got that phone call from my dad, I was, uh, I had the experience of doing this artificial insemination of a cow, you know, the <laughs> glove on, you know, remember that? And I'm up there like searching for ovaries and stuff. And and the guy is this, this true story. This guy, my, my buddy behind me, taps me on the shoulder, says, "Hey, Terry, see that guy over there?" And and and, and all of a sudden, this guy, poor guy, he, he had his arm like amputated here. He's carrying a pail of oats in his right hand. He's farmhand walking on on the University of Arizona farm. And and he said he lost his arm doing an artificial insemination of a gal. You know, and I and I'm like, 
I didn't know why you, what to think, but I pulled my arm out of there. Baz was like, good, left the glove inside. And it was a terrible experience, yeah. I'm sure, for the cow as right. well as for, for me. For both of you. But I started cracking up after because obviously he was, that was not true, but 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 but, but it was it just struck me as like so funny at the same time, so weird that what am I doing? Right. This is what I'm in college for to do artificial simulations of cow. This is a great thing for a lot of people. This isn't what I want to do. Yeah. And so I just it, that again was sort of an epiphany. I just went, I just got in my car, my old Volkswagen, I drove back to the campus and I and I changed my majors that day. And I said, he said, well, well, we'll work on something to change your major. No, no, you need to change it today. now, today. I need to get into business. And so, so I, I, I didn't really know what, why. Uh -huh. I just knew what I didn't want to do. And so when I graduated, Melinda, you know, there were, uh, you know, I, I, now, okay, I'm doing what better in school. Now I've got a work experience mm -hmm. and I keep getting promoted in the job. And so things are looking okay for me. And so I, I got a lot of interviews. Now, did you go through the Career Center? I went You're the, on campus. Did you I went through the Career, career Center? Center. This is. I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be terrible, good for the students, and terrible for the Career Center. Okay, so they only allowed me six interviews. I followed people into the men's room. <laughs> I, I, was, I just waited patiently yeah. while they're waiting to wash their hands. You know, I didn't follow them into the stall or anything. But I, but I, I followed people out to their car. Yeah. I, I was like a stalker. I was like a, a college interviewer stalker because I, I just wanted to get my resume in front of as many people as I possibly could. And the end result was I was only allowed six interviews. I got 13 job offers. Wow. So I got, I got my word out there and met people. Not everybody loved my approach, but enough of them did to give me a shot at another interview. Uh, and so it, really, it worked out for me. And you started then with Bullocks. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so among those companies was, was uh, Bullocks Department Store in Los Angeles. Here again, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And 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 at this point, okay, now I'm in debt. Now I got a car, and you could my fraternity brothers would steal my car because you could start it with a nail or a screwdriver. <laughs> you know, so it's like it was so beat up and so old this Volkswagen. And so um, I, I really wanted a new car. All I wanted was a new car. I didn't care what it was, but just something new. You could start with a key and this, you know, base things like that. And so I, I, uh, I, I just I said, well, who's going to pay the most? And I and I was determined to get job offers from you know all these companies, and I did. And and uh, Xerox offered me the most money. And then I flew, but I but I, I even knowing that I flew to on on Bullock's dime to Los Angeles, where I you know my which is near my hometown, and and went there on a Friday for an interview on purpose so I could spend the weekend and then fly back to school on Sunday and all this. And uh, a long story short, I fell in love with the the company, the people, the people that I met. This college interviewer, Gene Ross, uh, at the Bullock's, just had me. You know, he he was so impressive and such a wonderful guy, father figure to me and uh, showed an interest in me. And frankly, that's what made the difference. So I signed up for going to work for Bullocks. So how important was that element of having someone in the company that was interested in your career? You know, it's very something to look for uh, in an employer. It was for me. And um, uh, for, for the first thing, I think it, more important than that, I always encourage people to, to try to take an, a summer internship between your junior and se senior year um, because if you like the people that you're working with, not the company, not the job, the people that you're working with, you're likely to like working there full time and you're likely to get ahead there because you're kind of like them. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? You, you kind of have some relationship with them and it's natural. If you really don't like the people, and you're in it, but they're paying you a lot of money and stuff like that, I would tell you that that's probably not going to last. You're probably not either. You're not going to fit in and they're not going to like you long term or you're just going to get tired of it and you're going to want to leave. So so I think that the people that I met in the interview process were very important to me mm -hmm. and that had a big deal. And then and then and then the, secondly was I felt like they were paying attention to me. Unlike some of the other job offers that I received, I felt like the people that I met including as Gene Ross and a guy named Alan Questrom, mm -hmm. who was in my interview process, Mike Steinberg, different people in my interview process that I met at Bullock's, I felt that they were taking enough time with me that they actually were going to pay attention to me and that if I performed well, that I'd, I'd be on their radar screen. And I thought that did make a difference. So you mentioned performing well. So what are the, what are the components of that? It, not only in your career, but as you look at people that rise in your own organization, what, what qualities or skills do you, are you looking for? You know, well, what, 
the, the among the best pieces of advice that I received when I was in 22 years old or so, so was when I was going to work for Bullocks was um, uh, when I, I, I've been there for like four or five months. And, you know, now I think I'm pretty hot stuff, you know, and wondering why I'm not getting promoted. Mm -hmm. already. And so um, I, I go talk to this college recruiter and talk to him. I said, you know, I feel like I could be doing more. I feel like, you know, I'm just to have me doing these kind of meaning meaningless tasks and stuff and and he said he's the one that really talked to me about blooming where i'm planted yeah. you know and just re and 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 what he, his message to me was this do the job no matter how you know unimportant you think it is it's important for the company it has to get done so do that job extremely well a you know you need to have an attitude that you're going to do this better than anybody's ever done that job before. And B is you're probably going to get promoted when you do it well, and you're going to be supervising that job. Now you'll know how to yeah. do it really well. It was great advice. It really was good timing for me. And I, and I really have lived my career that way. I, I stopped looking ahead and, and started looking at the, the job at hand. And before I knew it, I was getting promoted and almost like, getting from it too fast because I would, I just said, no, I'm not done with this yet. Come on. I haven't really honed this skill yet. And, and I, and I, and that really had a positive impact. So I would encourage young people to don't be patient, but be incredibly diligent about learning the job you're in and then try to do that job. Even if you don't fully understand, learn everything about it and try to do it better than anybody's ever done it before. People will notice you're likely to, to, to uh, get great recognized advice. for that. Yeah. Bloom where you are planted. I've, I've heard that. I've heard you say that before. I think it is great advice. So, so often I think, especially today, our young alums want to go into the perfect job. They, they are looking for the perfect job and it just doesn't exist. You've got to spend some time focusing your, your, your interests and building that skill set. So I think that's and great And certainly advice. in my case, Melinda, I didn't know that retail was going to be a perfect job. And so I had to find that yeah. out along the way. So don't panic if you don't know exactly what you want when you come out of school. Right. Right. It, 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 you think have about the time. people. Think about your, you know, very often, I, like I, even I go to my stores organization today, I do a lot of visits and surprise visits typically. They probably know I'm here in Tucson, I'm oh, guessing. Oh, I'm guessing they I'm do. I'm guessing they do, so it won't be a big <laughs> surprise. But in most cities, I just pop in and, and visit the stores without announcement, and that's the best way to see it. But but I, I talk to people, even salespeople on the floor, and I and they know, oh, did you know uh, Mary got married last week? And I said, oh, great, awesome, Mary, congratulations. I said, anybody go to the wedding? And like, you know. Half the store raises their hand. That, that's, that's the right. core of friends, and that's true in the central office too. Is that you get you, you, your core of friends, personal friends, develop yeah. in the workplace if you're in the right place. Uh, so I mean, look for that. That's, that's you know, part of your success also was saying yes to those opportunities when they came along, and yeah. you've relocated several times throughout your career. Could you talk a bit about that? How how important was your willingness to to say yes and relocate when maybe you? Maybe that wasn't exactly what you wanted to yeah, do. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't part of my my plan, you know. And so, so um, when I I was working in uh, Los Angeles um, and I was living in Long Beach at the time, a place called Belmont Shore, which I still love. Uh, that was fine actually. When I first started, I was, I, my apartment was above a garage. You know, I had a, I had a studio mm -hmm. apartment above a garage, and I was commuting into downtown LA every morning. And, um, and, and, and that was just fine. But, but when I be, you know, when I got advanced and had a bigger and bigger job, you know, I started flying around and, and, and I, and I, and I need my hours became more demanding. And so I needed to be closer to, so I had to end up selling my home, getting a home eventually there. And then eventually selling my home, moving it closer to LA. Then I moved to Dallas, Texas, I could, because this opportunity for Neiman Marcus mm -hmm. came up and man, to be the CEO of Neiman Marcus when I was, you know, 37 years wow. old. It was a very big deal. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, packed up my family and, and, and moved. And of course it's hard, uh, but my family is very supportive and it, and it worked out great. And then, you know, 94 for me to move back to, uh, New York and, and, I thought about my family. Where do you, I said to my family, where do you want to live? You know, but I have to be within an hour and yeah. an hour or so of my office in New York city. And so we just did it kind of together, but it, yeah, it's hard and there's sacrifices involved, but you know, I never would have had the career that I've been able to have had I yeah. not accepted yeah. the fact that there are some difficulties that go along with it. And one of them is relocation, but also, you know, I look at it as an opportunity to advance my kids 
you know, have had a great life because they've lived in, in, in Southern California. They've great lived cities. in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. They've lived in Greenwich, Connecticut. My apartment's now in New York City. And so they've had these all these experiences, right. and uh, I think that's been good for them. That's great. Right. I know we've got questions. I think our yeah. questions actually are coming in. We've sure. got a lot more to talk about, but we've got some questions here. Um, we've got one coming from Kara in San Diego. We have, she wants to know what was has been your most rewarding job throughout your career? Uh, that's a good one. Um, I'll tell you, I think probably my a store manager. I was a store manager. You're in San Diego. I, I was a store manager of uh, Bullock's in South Coast Plaza. It's called Macy's in South Coast Plaza today. And it was a big change for me because I went from a, being a buyer and having two assistants in my buying office to having 400 people that I was now supervising in the store. And, you know, I had to learn about getting things done through other people. And I had to learn about making sure that the standards that I had for the best people in all these key jobs was there and that I was doing it the right way and the fair way and all of that. But man, these were totally different skills for me. And once I got that down and got into it a little bit and started seeing the results of what we could do together as a team, I think that was clearly my favorite job. Not, I'm not thinking, that was my best job. That was my uh, favorite job. I had a lot of other jobs since that have been really great. And I love, I love my job today. I love every job I've had, but that to me was a really fantastic job being the store manager. Lots well, of personal growth. It sounds like for you and personal growth, leadership skills, yes, and management. Ex exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's really great. great. I think we have another one. This sure. one comes from Kelly Proust in Houston. How are you, Kelly? Um, what helped you make the jump to executive level? You know, I think um, I, I think I go back to Kelly this um, this attitude that I I developed about you know bloom where you're planted. You know, I just really doing the job that I I was doing very very well. I think that's that that was very important. I also think that um, you know as that that job running the, the the store at South Coast Plaza was really important because I realized I couldn't do it all myself up until that point. I basically was the buyer. I was picking the, the inventory. I was working with the marketing department to just, you know, to, to define what the ad advertising should look like. You know, I was I was doing a lot of the stuff myself. I, when I when I realized that 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 the bigger your responsibility becomes, the more you have to depend on other people to get it done. That that you know was a, that was a key element I think that's that's given me the success that I've been fortunate to have because I have surrounded myself all of my career with outstanding people outstanding people and I and I'm so lucky to be able to go to work with this group every single day and learn from them uh, and it's we're working together to solve problems and create solutions for consumers uh, and do it in a in a very sophisticated way I mean that. To me is probably the best skill so we all do this stuff together as a team uh and i i certainly lead that team but i probably get more credit for because uh they you know they look for one person to give the credit to and the blame by the way but <laughs> um but it really wouldn't be possible without the skills that i think i've developed in and attracting motivating and retaining the best talent in the industry so that's what i would say would be the answer to your question can you uh, i'm going to actually probe a little bit more deeply, can you can you identify what those components are of being a great manager or motivator of people? Yeah. What, what is that? Well, well uh, the answer is the answer is yes. And you know, I I have these uh, I have regular meetings with young young people, uh, and and you know, I think you know the Breakfast Club I do, and regular, just about every month, and we bring and I let, I don't choose. I let the human resources team. Uh, bring together some high potential young people in our company, been with us just for a few years, and and let them just kind of ask me questions for an hour over breakfast, and and when we just uh, we just interact, and you can just listen to people, and they don't have to be the loudest person in the room. In fact, they're often not, but you know they're they're thoughtful, they're they're thinking about you know their questions, they're thinking about what other people are asking, and they're you can just tell they're engaged and they're they're thinking about it, and of course, then I can see what they've accomplished thus far in terms of their track record, how they get along with others in the group, sideways, up, people who work for them. And, um, you know, I think all of that information together is what's helped me assess. I may not be able to know exactly what some, you know, in, in 10 minutes what, you know, some, what somebody's true potential is, but I have a sense. I, I, have, I have a sense, generally speaking. And then that deeper probe about how they 
act 99% of the time that I don't see them and how they uh, interact. And again, I've had people who, who have really, you know, uh, sucked up to me, if that's the right word, but they've really played up to me very, very well. That, wow, that's, you know, I'm an impressive guy, you know, that's really cool. And then all of a sudden I hear, well, that person didn't treat the people below them very well. No interest, no interest in you. You know, I'm sorry, but you can't work here. You can't be part of my team if you don't treat the people who work for you, below you, in different capacities with the same respect that you give to me. That doesn't work for that's me. That's great advice. That's, that's great. I know that you are um, an employer for many of our own alums, uh, and we appreciate what Macy's has done. You've got, I think, well over 70 UA alumni working within your organization today. So, um well, we appreciate that, and I think you know, oh, we got great students we here. We do have great students so, here, obviously. You know, I'm really proud of yeah. uh, of the students that have come from the University of Arizona, and and they get the job. I mean, obviously, I'm very involved in the school, but they get the job because they earn this this job, and and we we have fantastic opportunities and, and interview tens of thousands of, of of students who are coming out of college for these jobs, and obviously can't higher, but a fraction of those. But I'm very proud to say that the University of Arizona is one of our top recruiting recruiting schools in the country. Uh, and it's because of the quality of student that we're getting from both our Terry Lundgren Center here as well as from the Eller College. College. And so I'm really proud of the students at the University of Arizona and how well they're doing at Macy's and Bloomingdale's. Right. Well, I have the opportunity in the Alumni Association to stay in touch with a lot of those employees, and I know they are having great careers, so it's very exciting. I have lots of questions, but I yeah. have to share with the people sure. who are watching, Let's so go. we have a couple more. Um, Stephen Brown in Oxnard, California asks, what is Macy's doing to attract and promote younger employees um, executive to executive management level to replace retiring baby boomers? Well, that's a great question. I have a great answer for oh, you. Good. Um, I know you do. Um, we, you know, the, 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 um, the, first of all, there's two, there's, there's two reasons why I focus on this. I re focus on this, the millennial, you know, for recruiting our future talent that's going to run our, our, our business in the, in the future, but they're also important customer. And we've made very good progress on both fronts. Last year, last few years, Macy's has hired, uh, approximately a thousand college students and graduates, about 250 uh, our, our college students uh, who are interning at Macy's or Bloomingdale's uh, in the summer between their junior and senior year. And then another 750 were hiring full-time positions into our executive development program. That makes us one of the largest college recruiters in the country. We are, we are the um, largest college recruiter on many campuses. And, uh, and we try not, we don't, we don't recruit from, you know, 500 campuses. We recruit from a, a relatively small number because I believe that if you can be, you know, uh, an important uh, re company engaged with a university like the University of Arizona, you and others are going to feed us great candidates, right? And I think if you get the top 10% of the students from any university in America, you're going to get amazing students. And so by, by top, I mean a combination of grade point average, uh, demonstration of hard work. I love it when a student is um, working and going to college, my own experience, or, or as an athlete and, and, and juggling that, or is in, a, in some sort of a professional club or something like that and doing that. But I, I just love busy, you know, 20 something year olds. I just love it when you're, when you're, when you're busy, you know, you're doing other, other things. And, and so I look for, I look for that. And it, you know, so it doesn't have to be a, you know, 4.2 grade point average with like you know, honors courses. It, it just, it has to be that combination is what I'm, I'm looking for. So we're a big recruiter. We're attracting and, and retaining uh, this, the, the, this, this group. The average age of Macy's.com is 29 years old. The average age, okay, consider that there are people like me, my age in that group. So the average age is 29 years old. So we have a very big and powerful population of, the, of young executives in our company, and that is the future of our company. That's great. So if, if we've got uh, viewers wondering if they could still join Macy's, even though they're no longer in college, do you hire alumni as well? Do you sure. Hire, you hire people that may be a few years out of school? Sure, we do. Um, obviously, you know, in those few years, they're going to be competing uh, with others mm -hmm. who are a few years, and, and so it's helpful if they have some experience in our, in our industry or experience in, in technology, and hire them there. 
experience in finance, hire them in our finance department, experience in store design. So if we have all these different career paths, but but clearly uh, we, we hire those who have already graduated a few years ago, just would be helpful if you've had in those three years relevant experience to the to the area of responsibility you're looking to uh, to work in at uh, Macy's or Bloomingdale's. Okay, um, we have another question here. All right, Cynthia in Cincinnati. What are you most excited about for Macy's future over the next five years? That's a good one. Yeah, it is a good one. Um, you know, because I look back at the last five years and it's been such an extraordinary run for our company. Uh, we've grown in the last five years by $5 billion in sales, $5 billion Fantastic. in revenues. And we've done it with without from 23 billion to 28 so it's not like it's not like you know we're 100 billion going to 105 it's it's a it's a huge increase and so when you think about it um uh, I'm, I'm very very proud and we've done it by the way with fewer stores than we had five years ago and it's all because of the whole omni channel the way the consumer is shopping now and we're now the seventh largest internet company in america wow. yeah so a lot of people don't understand that but we are the seventh largest internet company in america after netflix they're six and we're probably i'm trying to pass them in the next year or so uh mm -hmm. so so um what i think the next five years offers for us is this opportunity for for growth first you know the the whole omni-channel opportunity is it, it just is a moving target, which is very exciting. Customers changing, we're constantly changing to stay in front so of. So and and since we may not all be retail okay, people, well, sure. tell me what you mean by omni-channel. So today, the way the consumer shops is that you know he or she will pick up their phone and decide what am I looking for today? Okay, I'm looking for a a golf shirt, or I'm looking for a a, a, a blouse that I'm going to wear to this party, and and then they say, well. Do I, want, do I want a particular brand? Do I want to pay a certain price point? And just through some faceted navigation, you know, wherever they're on Google search or whatever, you know, you'll get some store recommendations and hopefully Macy's will be among them. It may be Bloomingdale's if it's a higher uh, quality item, but, but, but for college folks, it would be more, more likely to be Macy's. And so once they, then they just take that information and then they go to the store to actually touch the product, try on the blouse, try on the shoe, have the makeup artist apply the makeup the right way and, and to say this is right for your skin as opposed to what you've been using. Those, those kinds of benefits of the in-store experience, Melinda, are growing, they're not deteriorating. And so start with the phone, go to the store, and then they may not buy it then. They may not, first of all, they may not have all the money then, or they may want to be thinking about it more. They want to do, do a little more research. And so by the time they buy it, they might buy it on a, on a, a laptop or, or a tablet device, mm -hmm. something like that. And so um, that's the omni-channel experience, touching us in many ways with many devices. That customer who touches us multiple ways is eight times more productive in terms of what wow. they buy from our company than the, cu the customer who only shops online or only shops in our store. So we love this customer who touches yeah, us in, yeah. in, in, in many ways. That's the omni-channel experience. Lots of growth. We just started We just started this last fall season, same-day delivery. We figured out how to do that through a third-party um, service. You know, Uber's now. Are you using network. drones yet? We're not using no drones, drones okay. yet. Um, we still have human beings. Okay. So, uh, but but we are we, we, we are able to give, give a very fast, same-day same wow. delivery. And we did it in eight markets as a test. And um, and now we're expanding it to multiple markets this year. Um, and we you know we ship from our stores. We're doing all these various things that are all technology enabled that we couldn't do just a few years years ago. So that's one. Two is um, we've launched the off price business. So you've heard oh, of TJX yeah. or Nordstrom Rack or businesses like that. Well, we have thirteen Bloomingdale's uh, outlet stores, and we're adding more. But we've never had Macy's, and we're just start, we're launching this fall season. You'll see the Very first, exciting. yeah, you'll see the first uh, off price businesses for a new growth opportunity wow. there. Then you're going to see um, different sizes of stores that are much more digitally enhanced. Uh, so the stores will have much more technology and less inventory. But once you buy it, click on the merchandise or the walls or how we organize ourselves. We're still in developmental stage. Be a smaller store uh, and we'll deliver it to you from another one of our bigger stores that has the inventory. So we're thinking about new ways to present for growth. Uh, and then also we just bought this fantastic company called Blue Mercury, which is considered. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, which I is, love Blue you know, Mercury. Blue, I yeah, love it. Yeah. yeah we've see? got one here in Tucson. Right. It's a fantastic company. It's a, it's the fastest growing luxury beauty business yeah. in uh, in America. 
Uh, we now have 62 stores. We, we just bought it in March and, uh, and they're growing very rapidly. And so we'll open these additional freestanding stores. Mm -hmm. It's all the very high end brands, yes. oh, uh, Lemaire and Bobby yeah. Brown yeah. And, and Trish McAvoy and on Peels and I can go on and on. Magnificent product. Uh, and met much of that product we don't have at, at right. Macy's. Uh, and so this is an opportunity to expand some of that, those shops inside of Macy's, but mostly just roll it out into freestanding stores, both here and eventually someday internationally. Same. So we've got a lot of ideas for growth in the next five years, and hopefully you can tell uh, I'm very excited about it. Yes, I can. I was in uh, Bloomingdale's in Dubai. Yes. Have a Bloomingdale's there. Are you looking to expand potentially in the UAE? Or we the are. We are. We're opening. We've, we've got an amazing store, and I'm glad you yeah. visited in, in Bloomingdale's in Dubai. And so we've already announced that we're going to open in Abu Dhabi, which is only about yeah. an hour drive away from Dubai. Now I've been to many times. And we're going to have a Macy's and a Bloomingdale's in this new center um, uh, in, 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 Abu in, in Abu Dhabi, which is very fantastic. Very exciting, yeah. And, and, then we're, and then there's going to be more international. You'll hear more at, at the time when we're ready to announce right. something, but there's more ha happening on international. I can, very legitimately, you're excited, and I can see why. Um, another question here from Michael in New York City. With Amazon Prime and other online resources, what is Macy's strategy to compete? You know, the, um, the Amazon Prime is a is is actually a very good program. So you you know you spend ninety nine bucks. People say I get free delivery. Well, you don't get free delivery. You spend ninety nine bucks. So you pay ninety nine dollars, and then you get get free delivery. But it's a good it's a good program that encourages uh, encourages people. We're now doing you know free delivery if you spend over seventy nine dollars on your on your purchase. And so we do compete in that in that regard. But you also um, uh, this whole this whole subject of, of of speed of delivery is what's really moved forward. And once again, this is all enabled by new ideas. You know, when you think of uh, Airbnb, you think of uh, Uber, and you think of these other uh, ideas. What they are doing is using capacity that's out there and not being utilized. And there, and so therefore, it's, you think about your car. You got a car sitting in your garage or sitting in a parking lot. You know, somebody could be using that car to do something, to deliver product, deliver people or something mm -hmm. with it. And that's, and I, that's why I love that concept. And I give Uber uh, the, the, you know, a lot of the credit for really thinking about that, using capacity that exists that's just sitting there. And, and so the same thing now is possible for delivery. People are sitting that you know they they they, they have the, they have a the car they have time either one huh. and why not you put them together and figure out how to take take advantage of that as opposed to hiring huh. a service full time that's that that is delivering here and there now the capacity gets expanded extraordinary in an extraordinary way so so I I think more and more of this is going to allow us to all of the compete um, with the, with some of the good things that Amazon is is doing in that regard and I think that what Amazon doesn't have is stores. My prediction is someday they will have stores, but but uh, that's up to them. Hope they don't. Uh, but 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 what well, our great advantage is most customers still prefer if they want to return something to return it to a store as opposed to bundling it back in a box and then shipping mm -hmm. it shipping mm -hmm. it back. And by the way, if you do that too many times. With that to Amazon or anybody else, it's frankly just very unprofitable for the company. It's great for the consumer, which is always great, but the company eventually does have to make money. And so, so uh, having it come back to our stores is what we we always prefer, and the consumer has demonstrated that they prefer also because they may want to get it to something in their size that fits better, or a different brand that fits them better, or a look that's, that's just right for them. And so, having them come back into the store is really our answer to uh, to any of these pure play. Uh, retailers as a huge advantage for us. In fact, I just recently did a presentation called Stores Are the New Black because uh, because, oh. because it's not just right. about pure plays. As I said, we're the seventh largest internet company today, but we also have the advantage of having stores very conveniently located for whatever service you, you, you require from them. Interesting. That's great. So um, following up on that a little bit with this changing retail landscape uh, and some of these opportunities, what skills do you think will be needed in the future to be successful? Is it changing? It is changing. When I grew up, um, you know, you were basically in the stores organization and then you were in the central buying organization and you go back and forth, you know, at the different pyramid levels uh, to get your experience. I think today, I know today, it's much more on the around this Omni experience. And so we, we have we're having uh, many of our executives start in either the dot com world, either Macy's or Bloomingdale's dot com and then moving into the, the bricks 
uh, in, in, in the bricks and mortar business. And so the, in the Macy's building and the Bloomingdale's building businesses, department store building, and then going back and forth in that way, uh, that is, I think, and then having some understanding of technology and the uses of technology, that's become uh, more important. And then also the merchandise planning, mo rotating people into the merchandise planning. So today the, we're, we're so large. I mean, our buyers are, are for Macy's are buying for 775 locations. And so they can't do that on their own and really know what the customers want in Tucson versus Miami Beach versus, you know, Minneapolis. So, so we've, got, we've got a planning team who does. And, and they've got all these in, in input points coming in using technology again, but also people in these markets feeding us with the information about what the differences are, time of year, deliveries, weights of fabric, color preferences, size preferences. And then the planning executives take all what the buyer is buying and then carve it out to be very locally oriented, very specific to that market. And so we're, you, we're getting the, that exposure for these people as well. So that, and that's just on the merchandise side. If you're in finance or if you're in other, other parts of the business, we, we, we move you around to get the different experiences as well. So is the My Macy's strategy still part of, is it part of that, the, the planning? Oh, yeah. still a lot of... Very key to our success. And, and now and in the future is the My Macy's, uh, which My Macy's, yeah, that, 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 what, what that comes from is that you know, we, we wanted, we drew this on the back of a napkin back in 2009 when we were going from not, you know, eight buying offices into, into mm -hmm. one in New, York, in New York City. Uh, we said, how do we make sure we replicate the localization needs of what I just described right. customers in different markets? And by that, we had talent that we put into these different markets and they using technology. And now, now we've built it up because it's been several years. Mm -hmm. So we have institutional knowledge about what sizes to sell in Tucson versus, you know, in Orlando. So we've, we've, got, we've got that now sort of institutionalized. We've also got a sense about the color preferences in these various markets. But there are other things that we still need input on, and we're, do, we're, we're capturing that and using technology to feed it back. The planning organization has all, this da all these data points. Mm -hmm. And, they're, and so they're using all of this to make sure that we're, we're specifically responding to, the, responding to the stores so that they, when they walk in, the customer walks into an individual city, say in San Diego, the customer says, this is my Macy's. Right. You understand who I am in San Diego in the month of April because you get me, you get what I want, you've got that inventory, this is my Macy's. And that's where that's why that's that awesome. all came about. Yeah, yeah. It's, very, it's, it's very exciting. You can really see as you travel yeah. across the country to different stores. I think we have another question. This is Sam in New York City. If you were given an extra hour a day, what would you spend your time doing? Ah, oh, that's a good question because that's my that's my most precious commodity is my time. You know, I, if I had an extra hour a day, I would meet with more of our employees that don't have, have a chance to meet with me as often as I'd like uh, and, and probably perhaps them. So, so that was, that's what I would do. Um, I have a, I have a really crazy schedule. I'm not complaining about it. I just, but I'm just stating that it's, it's sometimes I have to explain to people why I just can't see them, you know, and they send me these notes and they're very interesting to me. I just can't see everybody. And it, it's actually okay because I, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, I have so many talented people that I trust that when I introduce this person to my team, that they'll give the yeah. same response that I would have given to them. So they don't need to see me, but I, I, it's hard to explain to people because they, they would like to, to get in front of me. So, but I, I would do that. I would like, I'd rather spend more time with my own employees that ex, with that extra hour if I, if I could. And really basically just taking their questions and, and responding to them. That's great. That's great. All right. Ashley has another question. What was your biggest career setback and how did you overcome to get where you are today? That's a really good question. Not that, just what you learned yeah. from success, but what do you learn from failure? Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Um, okay, Ashley. So when I was 35 years old, I actually thought that I basically was in heaven because I was the CEO of Bullock's Wilshire uh, in Los Angeles and living the dream. And, and so I had sold my house. Um, I had two little kids, you know, three year old and six months old, and 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 sold my house. I was moving to uh, downtown, you know, near near Los Angeles, West mm -hmm. Los Angeles, near my office because I was going to be working a lot and all that. But um, and all of a sudden, this guy interrupts my life, and he buys Federated Departments. We were oh, part of Federated yeah. Department Stores okay. at that time, and we were doing fine. Yeah. But the corporation was purchased by a guy named Robert Campo, Campo Corporation, out of uh, Canada. 
And so he bought our company believing that there's value in the real estate. It's funny how this is, can still keep coming around. Uh, and um, and uh, and I was I was out of a job. And you know how well, the way I was out of the job actually, I'll tell you, it was really hard for me because I literally was meeting the the, the CEO because Campo was bidding against Macy's, uh, you know, ironically enough. And, and and so Macy's stepped aside as long as Campo agreed to immediately sell in Bullock's, Bullock's, Wilshire, and IMAG and the whole West Coast operation, which is what um, Macy's wanted. And so they did that. And so um, I, I, my, my company was sold. It was sold to Macy's immediately. And the next thing, you know, here I am thinking that my my, my future's, you know, brand, and I, I don't have a house. I'm, so, I'm in escrow closing here. I'm in escrow buying over here. I got two little kids. I'm relocating. I got like, and and, and my life is suddenly in the air. Wow. And I didn't know what was going to happen. Well, I soon found out what was going to happen. And it wasn't a good thing because I got a call. I was waiting to meet the CEO and the president of Macy's Incorporated flying in from New York to meet me. And after the, this was announced, and uh, I got a call from our industry newspaper called Women's Wear Daily. And they said, hey, Terry. How do you feel about the fact that you've been replaced? Oh my God! I found out about this wow. from the newspaper. You know, I mean, and I'm like, I didn't have cold coffee. Like it was like six thirty in the morning. And I just walked into my office. I was getting ready for a meeting like at at eight, and and I didn't even have my coat off. And I was answering the phone, and I'm like, I was just stunned. Wow! wow. And, and I was like, Good what? morning. What? Uh, uh, well, actually, I didn't know this news, so uh, but, but I'm actually meeting, you know, the chairman and president a few in, in an hour or so. So uh, thanks for the heads up, you know. Thanks very much. And so I went and had that meeting, and actually, I was waiting for them just to come in and tell me right away. I met with them for 30 minutes, and they didn't say anything. And um, they apparently had a party for my replacement in New York the night before, <laughs> so it wasn't like this was wow. like you know a well kept secret, except for me on the West Coast. You know, time change. I didn't really get that memo, and so I mean, I was like, "What are you talking about?" And so, long story short, I said, "I, I got to ask this question: Is it true that I've been replaced?" And they said, "Oh yeah, I'm. I'm sorry, we were going to talk to you about that, but you know, we would bring this person in, and that's uh, you know, that's what you know. So I'm sorry, but you know, we we'll, we'll, we'll want to probably find something for you and all this. And so, you know, they talked, and I was really um. I was really set back because I had all this stuff in my head thinking, okay, what am I going to do? My family moving, sold my house. That, that, that. All, it wasn't just the job. And, um, and, and, and so, but I, that, so that was a huge setback for me and a, a really difficult experience. And I, and I think I was able to turn it really quickly around and recognize that now this wasn't just about me. In fact, I had a whole organization here at Bullock's Booster mm -hmm. who, also could have the same fate as myself if I didn't start talking about just how talented in a very honest way of showing some performance metrics about why they should survive and why they should get the job when they merge these, these companies. And so I, I, I kind of took me about 30 minutes to, you know, like have cold water thrown on my face. But, I, but when I did, I, I uh, came back and I started arguing that, that point. Let me tell you about how good these, and talented these people are why you should consider them for the company going forward. And that ended up wow. paying off. And every one of my, I think, I think I can say every one of the people that I recommended ended up getting a job and staying with the, with the company. And then they offered me a job, but it wasn't a meaningful job anymore. Really? It was just a, it was, it was a title. They called me president, but it was a job I had like two or three times earlier in my yeah, career, yeah. but it was just the same responsibility, but different title. And I said, that's okay. Thank you. And so I, that's when I left and I was, and I, and I was out of work for like six months. And, I, and so it was, a, it was kind of a terrifying time, wow. you know, uh, and I, and I was able to, I, I was able to convince the, the, the people that I was buying my house from that I was going to pull out of the escrow to buy that house, which is the first thing. And I got out of it. And then I was able to convince the people who were buying my house that I was in, in this difficult situation. I got out of that that situation. So now at least I had some stability back in my home with my family while I figured out what I was going to do for a living. And and obviously it worked out six months later. I became executive vice president of Neiman Marcus. And then shortly after that, less than a year, I became the CEO, chairman and CEO of Neiman Marcus. So, you know, it was terrifying, terrible, awful. And it, it couldn't have ended up in a better uh, outcome a, for me. That's a very good story. You know, and, and by the way, 
that outcome would not have happened if I was still the the, the president at that time of and the CEO of, of Boats Wilson because I never would have left. Yeah. You know, so I got a better job, a bigger job, a more even a more prestigious company uh, by being in an adverse situation. So you know, there's this saying that. Sometimes when a, when, a, when, a, when a door closes on you, a window opens, and you just have to know where to look to find it. <clears throat> That's a great story. We have another question. All right. This is Zoe in New York City. What do you think is the best strategy to gain millennial customers? Well, number one, Zoe, this will always be the answer. It starts in our business with the product. Okay. So you can have the most you know, the coolest shopping environment or the greatest website. Um, or whatever, the that nice, one most wonderful experience. And I think those are all important. But if you don't have the right product, it doesn't matter. And, and I think you're seeing that in a lot of the specialty stores in the mall today who are struggling because they just don't have the right product today that the millennial consumer wants. Fortunately, we do. We didn't always either, by the way. Um, we put a real concerted effort on creating our own. We couldn't find the right product in the marketplace. And so we really challenged our Macy's merchandising organization to respond. Uh, and, you know, there's this young millennial who's by 14 to 21 and through college, and you've got the, 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 the older 22 to 34 year old millennial who has got totally different needs in terms of wardrobe. And we've responded to both groups. And, and I would have, I'm happy to say that both our, our kids' business on the young side, as well as our, our, our more contemporary uh, business. Uh, and style lab, we call it, as well as the impulse business, which is the sort of the um, crosses over, but ca captures the older millennial is, is is the strength of our of our apparel business has been, and and some of the great brands like American Rag and and Maison Jewels and others that we've we've created uh, have really driven that. And so, and the other piece was getting very focused on athletic. This young consumer wants athletic apparel and athletic shoes. We did this arrangement with finish line that is a real credible source in the athletic footwear business. We significantly grow the business there. The young consumer is all over it. And so that's what we've done. Uh, we've really responded to it and, and, and it's been among the best performing parts of our business has been the millennial young men, young women business uh, for our company for the last two years. Well, I was in the uh, Herald Square store not too long ago and that floor with that shot of the millennial yeah. labels, it's amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> big transformation, Beautiful. big yeah. transformation, but it's always about the product, you know. So I you know, started there, and that's that. That's and we got to do more, by the way, uh, Zoe. So so we, we we've made some good progress. You know, the fashion business never ends, so you have to continuously reinvent and to try to get in front of of what's the next right fashion for uh, young consumers. And I again, I feel like we've got such a talented team of people um, at MMG and in our in our stores and our online businesses at both Macy's and Bloomingdale's. We're in a good position to continue that. That's a great, great. Um, oh, well, keep those questions coming. Here's Susan in Tucson. How do you, as CEO, create a motivated environment for employees across the country when they can't all interact with you personally? Yeah, and it's a very good question, and I think it's a, a hard one too because we have 176,000 employees um, in our company, and and I love to spend time with all of them, as I said earlier, and I can't. Uh, but but I think the way that we get at this subject is that we, we communicate and communicate and then we over communicate. And so I, I, I do a lot of these, you know, uh, these, these presentations, speeches, conversations, webcasts, um, store visits, uh, all, all of these things just to try to stay connected to our associates. And when I go to stores, it's really refreshing to have people recognize I me. Mean, I, sometimes I'd like to go incognito, you know, but uh, it's hard to do because even if I haven't been in a store in, you know, five years, you know, when you have 775 Macy's, it's kind of hard to get to all of them. Uh, but but even if I haven't been there for a while or a long time or maybe never since that associate's been there, um, people recognize me right away. And, 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 it's, and the only way they would recognize me is if they've seen me communicate with them. So they, that, that means they've heard our message. They've heard what our priorities are. They've heard about the mom's strategy, my Macy's Omni Channel Magic Selling. They've, they've heard, you know, these things. And I, and I think that's the key to keeping people engaged uh, is making them feel like this is great big company. And we talk internally about how we want to make this great big company feel uh, a lot 
lot smaller than it actually is. Like it's a mom and pop, you know, family run business. Just happens to be twenty eight billion dollars in you know national company and all that. But we really try to think like that. We try to we try to connect with people on that level. And then even my breakfast clubs, you know, you know, I, I th- I, while I can't meet with everybody. I get 14 in a room. That's what the room fits, and I, you know, I do it for some frequency. The word gets out that I'm a human being. You know, I'm not. You know, I'm I'm, I'm approachable, and uh, and I think that helps. He's people. a wildcat. Yeah, I'm an Arizona wildcat, wildcat right? That's great. By the way, great basketball run. Sean Miller yeah. could be proud. More <laughs> proud of you. What a great job he's done, and and led this team. Great football season. Yep. Only lost yeah. to Oregon, who didn't have a bad run. Final That's Four right. team, That's and right. so I'm. And I know we have a great baseball team. And a great golf team, also. So you know, this and swimming team. I mean, Arizona to go go Wildcats. Yeah, no kidding. Just got to. I just had to put in that commercial. <laughs> so we have about five more minutes. It looks like, and I have to ask you what you're doing in Tucson. What, yeah. What, okay. What you here, we're so glad we can do this from your center. But what? Tell us a bit about why you're here. So I'm in Tucson. I think because we have the the, the global um, retailing conference here every year this time of year. Uh, and we have a fantastic lineup of, of speakers, and we do this. In, in a, the reason why this conference is so unique, you know, there are definitely a lot of conferences out there that focus on the consumer and focus on you know retail innovation. Um, but there is no conference in the, that I'm aware of anywhere in the world that combines uh, the, this this conference with the most fantastic companies, the the, the best speakers, the leaders, the CEOs, the heads of different categories, talking to both industry executives and students. And that's what I love, you know, uh, th- that we're going to get a nice big population of students, qualified students who are interested in the retail industry. And they're going to hear from like the professors of our industries, you know, the CEO of Whole Foods, you know, is it's going to be, be speaking here. The president of Google is going to be, be speaking here. The, the, you know, Talia Sodi. Who has got, who's who's the number one pop artist in Mexico? But she has has launched a fashion brand with 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 Macy's. She's going to be here. Martine Reardon, who's who is the, the chief marketing officer of of Macy's. She's unbelievable. She not only does she do an amazing job of doing all the social marketing as well as the print media and all that. She runs this little thing called the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Wow. You know, and and the fireworks and the fashion shows and the flower shows and all the so she has an extraordinarily wide scope of responsibility and, and the people like that are going to be speaking for two days and 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 i think we're going to have just a riveting conversation and there's lots of q a like this uh where we're going to learn a lot and 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 i love this conference i mean i learn every time i take all these notes every time i come here and i bring them back to macy's and bloomingdale's and i say what are we doing about this what are we doing about that in fact one of the presentations I, I, I had from uh, two years ago was a, I'm not going to say what it is because now we're kind of locking this thing up, but we got this fantastic presentation about a digital store and about everything would be virtual and that about you would just there'd be one garment on the, on the fitting room and you would just wand your phone and cut and pro, plug in your size. Next thing you know, you go to your fitting room and the items there and it's all through you know, logistics and technology. And we're actually doing that in, in one of our stores as a, as a test right now. And, and, and so, I mean, I learned constantly from this and, and I, and I couldn't be more excited about uh, the next couple of days here in That's Tucson. Right. Well, we love having you here. This conference is one I've attended a couple of years myself um, and it is open to alums. Mm-hmm. It's open to students. It's open to other faculty from across the country. So it's a very diverse audience, which also makes it a great experience. So it happens every year about this time and you can find out about it through the website, the Terry J. Lundgren, uh, Terry J. Lundgren Center.org is the website. Uh, or globalretailingconference.org, I think, is the website for the, for the conference. So, right. yeah, it's, it's going to be a great couple of days. So um, any other questions? We're done with questions. Any other final bits of advice for those of us who are searching for careers? Well, I would just say um, don't give up, uh, you know, and, and also make sure that you, you think about what I, what I said in terms of the of the of, of the the people in the company that sort of defines, uh, you know, how, how your experience is going to go in that company. So try to find, uh, if you can, uh, a company where you really like the individuals. And if you do that, you're likely to do well there because you're going to enjoy that experience. And if you do well there, you're likely to have a successful career. So I would just, I would just say that, and then the don't give up part is, um, you know, it's challenging out there. I know that, 
uh, because we're basically at full employment, you know, for the, for the most part in America today with only in the, in the range of 5% unemployment. So that we're basically at full employment uh, today. Don't give up. Um, you know, you, th there are people who will, will hire you um, if you are indeed knowledgeable about the about where you're going to work and why you want to work for that company. If you're able to convince every individual company, which is what I try to do, that theirs is the company you want to work for and you have actual information backing up why, you, this would be a great company, a great match for you. You're most likely to get their attention. So good luck to you, everybody, and I'm uh, glad to be with you today. Well, and thank you again. The only thing I would add to those wise words is look for Wildcats. It's also great if they're alumni in the organization because we like Wildcats, hiring Wildcats. That's part of our presentation today. This is our alumni career services program. You can look at our website through ArizonaAlumni.com slash careers. You can listen to this presentation and get lots of information about how to connect with Wildcats. So thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Terry, and bear down. Thanks, Linda. Go Wildcats.